Chapter Eight of the Beckoning Fair One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Beckoning Fair One by Oliver Onions. Chapter Eight. To the man who pays heed to that voice within him, which warns him that twilight and danger are settling over his soul, terror is apt to appear an absolute thing, against which his heart must be safeguarded in a twinkle unless there is to take place an alteration in the whole range and scale of his nature. Mercifully, he has never far to look for safeguards. Of the immediate and small and common and momentary things of life, of usages and observances and modes and conventions, he builds up fortifications against the powers of darkness. He is even content that, not terror only, but joy also, should for working purposes be placed in the category of the absolute things and the last treason he will commit will be that breaking down of terms and limits that strikes, not at one man, but at the welfare of the souls of all. In his own person, Oleron began to commit this treason. He began to commit it by admitting the inexplicable and horrible to an increasing familiarity. He did it insensibly, unconsciously, by a neglect of the things that he now regarded it as an impertinence in Elsie van Gogh to have prescribed. Two months before, the words, a haunted house, applied to his lovely, bemusing dwelling, would have chilled his marrow. Now, his scale of sensation becoming depressed, he could ask, haunted by what? And remain unconscious that horror, when it can be proved to be relative, by so much loses its proper quality. He was setting aside the landmarks. Mists and confusion had begun to enwrap him and he was conscious of nothing so much as of a voracious inquisitiveness. He wanted to know. He was resolved to know. Nothing but the knowledge would satisfy him, and craftily he cast about for means whereby he might attain it. He might have spared his craft. The matter was the easiest imaginable. As in time past he had known, in his writing, moments when his thoughts had seemed to rise of themselves, and to embody themselves in words not to be altered afterwards. So now the questions he put himself seemed to be answered even in the moment of their asking. There was exhilaration in the swift, easy processes. He had known no such joy in his own power since the days when his writing had been a daily freshness and a delight to him. It was almost as if the course he must pursue was being dictated to him. And the first thing he must do, of course, was to define the problem. He defined it in terms of mathematics. Granted, that he had not the place to himself, granted that the old house had inexpressibly caught and engaged his spirit, granted that, by virtue of the common denominator of the place, this unknown co-tenant stood in some relation to himself. What next? Clearly the nature of the other numerator must be ascertained. And how? Ordinarily this would not have seemed simple, but to Oleron it was now pellucidly clear. The key, of course, lay in his half-written novel, or rather, in both Romilly's, the old and the proposed new one. A little while before, Oleron would have thought himself mad to have embraced such an opinion. Now he accepted the dizzying hypothesis without a quiver. He began to examine the first and second Romilly's. From the moment of his doing so, the thing advanced by leaps and bounds. Swiftly he reviewed the history of the Romilly of the fifteen chapters. He remembered clearly now that he had found her insufficient on the very first morning on which he had sat down to work in his new place. Other instances of his aversion leapt to confirm his obscure investigation. There had come the night when he had hardly forborne to throw the whole thing into the fire, and the next morning he had begun the planning of the new Romilly. It had been on that morning that Mrs. Barrett, overhearing him humming a brief phrase that the dripping of a tap the night before had suggested, had informed him that he was singing some air he had never in his life heard before, called The Beckoning Fair One. The Beckoning Fair One. With scarcely a pause in thought, he continued. The first Romilly having been definitely thrown over, the second had instantly fastened herself upon him, clamouring for birth in his brain. He even fancied now, looking back, that there had been something like passion, hate almost, in the supplanting, and that more than once a stray thought given to his discarded creation had, 
It was astonishing how credible Oleron found the almost unthinkable idea, had offended the supplanter. Yet that a malignancy almost homicidal should be extended to his fiction's poor mortal prototype, in spite of his inuring to a scale in which the horrible was now a thing to be fingered and turned this way and that, a uh, good God broke from Oleron. This intrusion of the first Romilly's prototype into his thought again was a factor that for the moment brought his inquiry into the nature of this problem to a termination. The mere thought of Elsie was fatal to anything abstract. For another thing, he could not yet think of that letter of Barrett's, nor of a little scene that had followed it, without a mounting of colour and a quick contraction of the brow. For wisely or not, he had had that argument out at once. Striding across the square on the following morning, he had bearded Barrett on his own doorstep. Coming back again a few minutes later, he had been strongly of the opinion that he had only made matters worse. The man had been vagueness itself. He had not been to be either challenged or browbeaten into anything more definite than a muttered farrago in which the words, Certain things, Mrs. Barrett, respectable house, if the cap fits, proceedings that shall be nameless, had been constantly repeated. Not that I make any charge, he had concluded. Charge, Oleron had cried. I have my ideas of things, as I don't doubt you have yours. Ideas? Mine? Oleron had cried wrathfully, immediately dropping his voice as heads had appeared at windows of the square. Look you here, my man. You've an unwholesome mind, which probably you can't help, but a tongue which you can help, and shall, if there is a breath of this repeated. I'll not be talked to on my own doorstep like this by anybody, Barrett had blustered. You shall, and I'm doing it. Don't you forget there's a God above all who has said, You're a low scandalmonger, and so forth, continuing badly what was already badly begun. Oleron had returned wrathfully to his own house, and thenceforward, looking out of his windows, had seen Barrett's face at odd times, lifting blinds or peering round curtains, as if he sought to put himself in possession of heaven knew what evidence, in case it should be required of him. The unfortunate occurrence made certain minor differences in Oleron's domestic arrangements. Barrett's tongue, he was gathered, had already been busy. He was looked at askance by the dwellers of the square, and he judged it better, until he should be able to obtain other help, to make his purchases of provisions a little farther afield rather than at the small shops of the immediate neighbourhood. For the rest, housekeeping was no new thing to him, and he would resume his old bachelor habits. Besides, he was deep in certain rather abstruse investigations, in which it was better that he should not be disturbed. He was looking out of his window one midday, rather tired, not very well, and glad that it was not very likely he would have to stir out of doors, when he saw Elsie Bengo crossing the square towards his house. The weather had broken. It was a raw and gusty day, and she had to force her way against the wind that set her ample skirts bellying about her opulent figure and her veil spinning and streaming behind her. Oleron acted swiftly and instinctively. Seizing his hat, he sprang to the door and descended the stairs at a run. A sort of panic had seized him. She must be prevented from setting foot in the place. As he ran along the alley, he was conscious that his eyes went up to the eaves, as if something drew them. He did not know that a slate might not accidentally fall. He met her at the gate, and spoke with curious volubleness. "'This is really too bad, Elsie. Just as I'm urgently called away. I'm afraid it can't be helped, though, and you'll have to think me an inhospitable beast. He poured it out just as it came into his head. She asked if he was going to town. Yes, yes, to town, he replied. I've got to call on... on Chambers. You know Chambers, don't you? No, I remember you don't. A big man you once saw me with. I ought to have gone yesterday, and... This he felt to be a brilliant effort. And he's going out of town this afternoon. To Brighton. I had a letter from him this morning. He took her arm and led her up the square. She had to remind him that his way to town lay in the other direction. Of course, how stupid of me, he said with a little loud laugh. I'm so used to going the other way with you. Of course, it's the other way to the bus. Will you come along with me? I am so awfully sorry it's happened like this. 
they took the street to the bus terminus. This time Elsie bore no signs of having gone through interior struggles. If she detected anything unusual in his manner, she made no comment, and he, seeing her calm, began to talk less recklessly through silences. By the time they reached the bus terminus, nobody, seeing the pallid-faced man without an overcoat and the large, ample-skirted girl at his side, would have supposed that one of them was ready to sink on his knees for thankfulness that he had, as he believed, saved the other from a wildly unthinkable danger. They mounted to the top of the bus, Oleron protesting that he should not miss his overcoat, that he found the day, if anything, rather oppressively hot. They sat down on a front seat. Now that this meeting was forced upon him, he had something else to say that would make demands upon his tact. It had been on his mind for some time, and was, indeed, peculiarly difficult to put. He revolved it for some minutes, and then, remembering the success of his story of a sudden call to town, cut the knot of his difficulty with another lie. "'I'm thinking of going away for a little while, Elsie,' he said. She merely said, "'Oh?' "'Somewhere for a change. I need a change. I think I shall go tomorrow, or the day after. Yes, tomorrow, I think.' "'Yes,' she replied. "'I don't quite know how long I shall be,' he continued. "'I shall have to let you know when I am back.' "'Yes, let me know,' she replied in an even tone. The tone was, for her, suspiciously even. He was a little uneasy.' "'You don't ask me where I'm going,' he said, with a little cumbrous effort to rally her. She was looking straight before her, past the bus driver. "'I know,' she said. He was startled. "'How, you know?' "'You're not going anywhere,' she replied. He found not a word to say. It was a minute or so before she continued, in the same controlled voice she had employed from the start. You're not going anywhere. You weren't going out this morning. You only came out because I appeared. Don't behave as if we were strangers, Paul. A flush of pink had mounted to his cheeks. He noticed that the wind had given her the pink of early rhubarb. Still, he found nothing to say. Of course you ought to go away, she continued. I don't know whether you look at yourself often in the glass, but you're rather noticeable. Several people have turned to look at you this morning. So, of course, you ought to go away. But you won't, and I know why. He shivered, coughed a little, and then broke silence. Then if you know, there's no use in continuing this discussion, he said curtly. Not for me, perhaps. But there is for you, she replied. Shall I tell you what I know? No, he said in a voice slightly raised. No, she asked, her round eyes earnestly on him. No. Again, he was getting out of patience with her. Again, he was conscious of the strain. Her devotion and fidelity and love plagued him. She was only humiliating both herself and him. It would have been bad enough had he ever, by word or deed, given her cause for thus fastening herself on him. But there, that was the worst of that kind of life for a woman. Women such as she, business women, in and out of offices all the time, always, whether they realised it or not, made comradeship a cover for something else. They accepted the unconventional status, came and went freely, as men did, and were honestly taken by men at their own valuation, and then it turned out to be the other thing after all, and they went and fell in love. No wonder there was gossip in shops and squares and public houses. In a sense, the gossipers were in the right of it. Independent, yet not efficient, with some of womanhood's graces foregone, and yet with all the woman's hunger and need, half sophisticated, yet not wise. Oleron was tired of it all. And it was time he told her so. I suppose, he said tremblingly, looking down between his knees, I suppose the real trouble is in the life women who earn their own living are obliged to lead. He could not tell in what sense she took the lame generality. She merely replied, I suppose so. It can't be helped, he continued. 
but you do sacrifice a good deal. She agreed, a good deal, and then she added after a moment, what, for instance? You may or may not be gradually attaining a new status, but you're in a false position today. It was very likely, she said. She hadn't thought of it much in that light. And, he continued desperately, you're bound to suffer. Your most innocent acts are misunderstood. Motives you never dreamed of are attributed to you. And in the end it comes to... He hesitated a moment and then took the plunge. To the sidelong look and the leer. She took his meaning with perfect ease. She merely shivered a little as she pronounced the name. Barrett. His silence told her the rest. Anything further that was to be said must come from her. It came as the bus stopped at a stage and fresh passengers mounted the stairs. You'd better get down here and go back, Paul, she said. I understand perfectly, perfectly. It isn't Barrett. You'd be able to deal with Barrett. It's merely convenient for you to say it's Barrett. I know what it is, but you said I wasn't to tell you that. Very well. But before you go, let me tell you why I came up this morning. In a dull tone he asked her why. Again she looked straight before her as she replied, I came to force your hand. Things couldn't go on as they have been going, you know, and now that's all over. All over, he repeated stupidly. All over. I want you now to consider yourself, as far as I'm concerned, perfectly free. I make only one reservation. He hardly had the spirit to ask her what that was. If I merely need you, she said, please don't give that a thought. That's nothing. I shan't come near for that. But, she dropped her voice. If you're in need of me, Paul, I shall know if you are. And you will be. Then I shall come at no matter what cost. You understand that? He could only groan. So that's understood, she concluded. And I think that's all. Now go back. I should advise you to walk back, for you're shivering. Goodbye. She gave him a cold hand, and he descended. He turned on the edge of the curb as the bus started again. For the first time in all the years he had known her, she parted from him with no smile and no wave of her long arm. End of Part 8